avoid his personal life, help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked him to share with you uh, this presentation, presentation, Future Proving Success with Neuroscience. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Gleb. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate that kind introduction, Lisa. All right, everyone. So let's think about you as quality professionals, current ones and future ones. Or if you don't go into quality, if you're just kind of taking classes in that, you want to know about that as a field. Obviously, you would not be taking classes about it otherwise. And let's think about what future proofing means for you and in general what it means. So future proofing refers to the ability to predict and address dangerous threats and missed opportunities in the future. That's what future proofing is about. That is the essence of future proofing. And unfortunately, our minds, we're talking about it for neuroscience because our minds are not very well equipped for dealing with future proofing, not very well equipped for dealing with forecasting the future and addressing the dangerous threats associated with the future. So this is why it's really important for you to learn about future proofing and to be able to assess and address such threats. How is our mind going to lead us astray? And how can we prevent the problems in our mind from leading us astray? That's what it's about. Especially from the perspective of quality, what quality involves is predicting essentially when products or services, processes will go wrong and preventing that. Or another aspect of quality is when there's an opportunity to improve things, so missed opportunities that aren't predicted and addressed. So it's really important from perspective of quality to think about future proofing. And that is definitely a role that quality professionals play a lot. They talk with people in engineering, people in R&D, people in operations and tell them that, hey, we are, if we don't follow these processes, we might face these threats. That's kind of one processes and also one-off threats. So one is processes, another is one-off threats. And you want to be aware of the ways that our mind typically leads us astray so that we don't notice the threats, the dangerous judgment errors we'll talk about that cause us to make bad decisions in forecasting the future and in addressing these problematic for these forecasts of problems and opportunities. So that's what we really want to focus on. And that's what future proofing is about. Now, let's talk about how do we actually go about future proofing. The first of these really dangerous judgment errors in future proofing for US quality professionals, future quality professionals, or just professionals who care about quality to be aware of is called the normalcy bias. The normalcy bias. This is a dangerous judgment error where we tend to assume that everything will keep going normally. So think about from the perspective of quality, right? There's a certain process going on. Let's say you're doing some engineering quality manufacturing and the tendency is to assume that everything will keep going as it was. But what if there was always a risk of something going wrong and there was just certain, it was just not going wrong because of chance. And finally something does go wrong. That is, a, thing that pretty frequently happens. We see that that happens with when there's quality breakdowns and we don't realize they're happening. We see that with changes, especially in processes and practices that may not be effectively communicated to the quality team that result in serious errors and serious problems. And we see underestimation, especially in new projects. For example, with the Boeing 737 MAX, right? That's a notorious example of a horrible, horrible failure of future proofing, including in the quality sections of Boeing. It doesn't get much better than the quality sections of Boeing, you'd think, but clearly they made a number of dangerous judgment errors. And a major issue with them was because of the normalcy bias. They assumed that everything will keep going normally. And it led us to forecast the short-term future based on the short-term past. What is the short-term past with Boeing? Well, we saw that with Boeing, the past models of 737, in general, the past models of Boeing, all kept getting safer. So the newer models were at least as safe as older models and generally quite a bit safer. Less accidents, less problems. So it was very hard to conceptualize mentally, so kind of the neuroscience aspect, that, hey, this new plane might be less safe. Now, the 737 MAX 
is better in many ways in terms of fuel consumption, which was the crucial competitor with Airbus. That was the thing that they were competing on with the new plane offered by Airbus was took required less fuel than the seven than the Boeing models and Boeing rushed the 737 Max into production partially in order to compete with Airbus and they thought well you know despite all of this internal information from the company that, that the, there was information that there were some issues with the 737 Max it, it'll be just at least as safe as the previous planes and it'll be better on fuel so let's go ahead and produce it very bad idea, very bad tendency, but that's really what happened. And that's a normalcy bias. We underestimate the likelihood and the impact of major disruptions, especially in new situations, but also in older ones when the context changes. And of course, the COVID pandemic was a huge example of underestimating the extent of future disruptions. And so is the supply chain, so is inflation. We see that all around us right now. But I'm giving you the concrete case of the Boeing 737 MAX as something you might actually deal with on a smaller scale within your own work as a quality professional. And you can start to look for, hey, is there a normalcy bias that might be present here and take steps to address it. Now, given that, you'll see a poll right now and you'll have an opportunity to answer the poll. Do you think it would be valuable for you and your team, if you have a team, of course, to investigate and address negative impacts from the normalcy bias. So would that be valuable for you? It doesn't have to be, maybe you'll think it's not valuable, but that's up to you to vote for it. So please go ahead. So you have about two thirds participated. I'll give you five more seconds if you haven't made your voice heard yet. Okay, definitely very popular. So everyone here thinks the normalcy bias should be addressed. And usually I see something like a breakdown of maybe 80%, 70%. So definitely very popular. Good, good to see that. Let's go on to the broader framework. So here we see the normalcy bias. Now what's going on here? Why do we have these dangerous judgment errors in our minds, right? Ideally, we would not have the normalcy bias present in our minds. Ideally, we would not be irrationally assuming that the future is going to be much like the past. The problem is we tend to go with our gut. We follow our intuitions, we go with our heart, we feel like we should be authentic. That is what gurus tell us to do. People like intuitions, be primal, be savage, right? That's what Tony Robbins says. Unfortunately, that's very bad advice. You know, Malcolm Gladwell says, blink, make your decision in the blink of an eye. That is really problematic advice because it feels very comfortable. And you know, there's a reason that Malcolm Gladwell and Tony Robbins get paid a lot of money when they tell you what you want to hear anyway. <laughs> they get people get paid a lot of money for doing that. But that is actually very, very bad advice for making good decisions, high quality decisions, because our gut intuition does not lead to good outcomes in many cases. It leads can lead to disasters like the 737 Max disaster or people's failure to really prepare well for the COVID pandemic and address it effectively. People, if you remember way back when to about two years ago, so just over two years ago, so many people thought the pandemic would last a couple of weeks or maybe a month or two. And I was already saying back way back then that would last that it would last for a couple of years, but it's something that people intuitively don't want to hear. They want to hear that it'll last a week, maybe it'll last a month, and those are the people who get paid attention to and who get paid a lot of money. And you don't want to put yourself in that position. You don't want to put yourself in the position of listening to, listening to comfortable things that often lead to disaster because the intuition, it feels right. And that's what's really important for you to realize. It feels right. This feeling of rightness is something that was very useful and valuable for when our gut evolved for, for what our intuition evolved for, the ancient savanna environment. It's not evolved, it's not adapted for the modern world. So our intuition, our feelings of gut reactions, all of those sorts of things, our emotions, they're evolved for the ancestral savanna. In the modern world, where we're interacting with each other <laughs> through these small squares, the internet has been around since the 1990s, Widespread use of video conferencing has been around since the 2010s, right? We are not involved for that. We're involved for the ancestral savannah. 
We lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. We need to rely on the fight or flight reflex, very much so, in order to survive and thrive. And so we needed to jump at 100 shadows in order to get away from that one saber-toothed tiger. You might have heard of this also as the saber-toothed tiger response. So those ancestors who jumped at 100 shadows to get away from that one saber-toothed tiger, they were very overconfident. They made very quick snap judgments and they survived and thrived and reproduced. And we are their descendants. The ones who didn't make quick snap judgments, they're the ones who were eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. And they, so they, they're the ones who died. We're the descendants of those who didn't die. And therefore, we have a number of judgment errors stemming from that evolutionary heritage. So these dangerous judgment errors, they are called cognitive biases, cognitive biases. And the normalcy bias is just one out of over 100 of these cognitive biases. So we have these, and that's why we're talking about the neuroscience here. They are really quite problematic decision-making errors that come from our evolutionary background and the structure of our brain, the way our mind is wired. Our mind is inherently wired to be lazy, to not seek more information than our gut intuition tells us it needs to make decisions and to not think very hard. And I'm not criticizing anyone here or myself or just our minds. That's the way we're structured. And it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective for us to not waste glucose in an environment where glucose was insufficient. In our current environment, we have tons of glucose. We have sugar all around us. We have way too much sugar for our own good. But our mind is still wired to conserve. And so our mind causes us to think much less than we actually should about questions about how to make good decisions and about making good forecasts for the future. We make snap judgments very quickly and erroneously based on the information available. So that's a problem. Now, Let's take a look at another poll. And I want to ask you whether you ever made a bad decision. And looking back, you realize you had the information you needed to make a better decision. So you think, oh, I should have known that. I should have made a better decision. I had the information available, but I still made a bad decision. So please go ahead and vote on whether that happened to you or not. See most people participated, 80%. I'll give you five more seconds for those who didn't yet. Great. So we see overwhelmingly this happened to almost everyone here. So that's quite, quite common, obviously. And then when you realize that that's the essence of these cognitive biases, Cognitive biases are about information. So the information that we interpret incorrectly. When we have all the information we need to make the right decision, if we were fully rational beings, we would make the right decision, but we're not. We have these dangerous judgment errors. And the reason you made a bad decision when looking back at it is very likely that you fell into one of these dangerous judgment errors. As I mentioned, there are over hundred and I'll send you some resources after the presentation about them. So that you can read from, I'll only get to a couple during the presentation because we have limited time. Now, another one that's especially, especially important for you as quality professionals to be aware of is the planning fallacy. So the planning fallacy. You might've heard of the phrase that failing to plan is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. That's a very common phrase and quality professionals here at all time, I hear a number of them using it. Now, unfortunately, that's a dangerous phrase. It's misleading in many ways because it causes us to feel that when we make a plan, things will go according to plan. And that's not actually the reality. As for example, Russia discovered in its plan for invading Ukraine, that was not a very, they clearly did not have quality people overlooking that plan, right? So this, and there are a number of other similar incidents that we can talk about, not simply in military, but in business, right? Many, many bad decisions, many bad plans. And so this planning fallacy comes from the fact that when we make a plan, we feel that things will go according to plan. In reality, what I teach my clients and what I train people to have, instead of saying failing to plan is planning to fail, have the phrase failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. So much, much better phrase. That's something that you really should integrate into your own mindset and consciousness. 
Failing to plan for problems is planning to fail because our intuition is to assume that the future will go according to plan. So we underestimate problems, we underestimate risks and the resources needed to address these problems. Resources of time, of money, of information, social capital, connections. For example, there was a study of major construction projects which found that they tend to go over budget slash time about 86% of the time. There was another study of major software projects like database implementation. They found that they tend to go over budget and time about 81% of the time. So major projects especially tend to go over budget. I was talking, uh, this was about five days ago, to the leadership team of a chain of major restaurants. So major restaurant chain, it's, oh, I think it's valued at something like 300 million. So that's kind of the, the scope of the restaurant chain. And they open new restaurants regularly. And I was talking to them about the planning fallacy. And I asked, well, when you're opening a new restaurant, when you're assessing any major project, do you talk about whether it might fail and how it might fail and how to address this? And they said, no, we don't. And then I asked them, well, how often do you go over time? How often do you go over budget in your restaurant construction costs? And they tell me 90% of the time. <laughs> so this is a classic example of planning fallacy, right? They're clearly, it's an organization that systematically falls into it. And they're still successful, obviously, but they're not nearly as successful as they could be if they took planning fallacy into account and addressed it in advance. So that's something I'll be working with them on. Now, what about for you? Do you think it would be valuable for you and your team, if you have one, to investigate and address any negative impacts from the planning fallacy? See, we have 83% of the people participating. Five more seconds for those who didn't yet. Great. So we have 96% of the people believe it will be valuable for them. Great. So again, this is information both for the normalcy bias and the planning fallacy that you can take and bring back to your leadership team. So if you have leadership teams who you think would need some advice on this, just like I have the leadership team with which I'm working with this major restaurant chain. Those are the kinds of things that you want to be thinking about. How can you notice these things in your organization, in your team, in your context, in your class, and address these things by bringing the information to others and also thinking about it yourself. All right, now let's think about how do we address these sorts of problems. One of the ways that we want to address these sorts of problems is awareness. You want to be aware of these dangerous judgment errors. And that's the first step to addressing them because if, you know, if you're not aware of them, you will not be able to address them effectively. So a great way to be aware of them is an assessment on dangerous judgment errors, which focuses on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings. So the 30 most dangerous ones, and I'll send you an impact on your workplace and provides the next steps for addressing. So I'll share my screen now so you can see what the assessment looks like. You should all be able to see my screen. And I'll also ask you to pull up the chat. So we'll be using the chat for this, for this portion. So take a look at the assessment. So the descriptions, the directions. Each question below refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. And you want to indicate how often it occurred in your workplace in the past year. The answer for each will be in percentage terms. So out of all the times that it could have occurred, how often did it occur? You don't really want to overthink it. You should be very quick in making your, your initial idea, your initial thought is very likely to be the right one. So this is how you should be approaching. So each question should take you 15 to 20 seconds. So let's take a look at the questions. First, is exactly what we're talking about. What percentage of projects missed the deadline or went over budget in your organization? So please, in the chat, put down the number. So Justin, that puts down 50%. Others, please go ahead. Put down the number in your organization. Ten percent, twenty percent, forty percent, fifty percent, Joshua, 
65%, Sierra 20%, Sue 60%, Christopher 60%, Zach 25%, um, McKenna 10%, Caitlin 10%, Jenna 10%, Heather 45%, 50%. So we see a wide range, right? So some organizations like the, the like the restaurant chain had 90%. Some have 65, 50%, some have 10%. So it depends on the organization, depends on your workplace. If you're in the 10 to 20% range, this is not a, that big of a deal. It happens just because of variance. If you're in the 20, if you're in the 30 to 40% range, this becomes more of, a, more of, a, of an issue because you really can improve things through direct resources. If you're in the 40 and above, that, that becomes a serious issue. You definitely want to be working hard on addressing this problem specifically. So this is the kind of thing that you want to be thinking about as you take this assessment. Now let's go on to a different type of problem that you'll see in, qual in quality decision-making. Of all significant decisions, in what percentage of cases was someone overconfident about their decision? So overconfidence, meaning at least one person on the decision-making side was overconfident in their decision. So 65% from Justin, others please. Go ahead. 40%, 70%, 60%, 80%, 60%, 40%, 30%, 50%, 40%, 30%, 25%, 70%. So it seems a little bit higher than the planning fallacies, this overconfidence. So please go ahead, keep putting in numbers. But in the meantime, this is called the overconfidence bias, where we tend to be way too confident about the quality of our decision making. We tend to be way too confident about the quality of how we approach life and the, how we approach our professional decision making and also personal decision making, of course. So this is a big problem, the overconfidence bias. And we need to be aware of it that we tend to be overconfident and decrease our confidence. And that's not a problem that you want to, you, that you'd want to be able to bring to your leadership team. Now, what about number five? Of all times, so in a meeting, let's say, when an individual or a team had to deal with difficult or uncomfortable issues, they focused on more trivial issues. So there was much more time spent on trivial issues that needed to be spent on it and more difficult, hard issues weren't really addressed. Okay, I see we have pretty big ones here. 70, 75%, 80%, 80%, 75%, 60%, 75%, 75%, 80%. Yes, so clearly happens very, very frequently. This is a dangerous judgment error called bike shedding. Bike shedding. It's a weird name. It was named for when it was originally discovered where a team designing a nuclear reactor spent way too much time on a bike shed near the nuclear reactor as opposed to comparatively on the nuclear reactor itself. So this is a big problem I tend to see in quality situations. So with quality professionals who spend much more time than they need on a smaller issue of quality processes, practices, and tend to not get to larger issues that have to do with people conflicts, where you have to get into a conflict with people and deal with tensions and stresses with people. Quality professionals tend to be more comfortable with technical issues and processes and focus much more time on those than they should compared to what they actually need to be doing to address the essential, difficult, or uncomfortable issues that are much more important to the outcome. Now, these are just three examples. And there are, of course, 27 more in total of these. And I'll send you the assessment afterward. But a great thing to do for you would be to get you with, together with your team or with your class, if you're part of a class, and have everyone take the assessment. And then take the next steps to address the findings based on the assessment. So figure out which one of these is the most problematic for you. And then the assessment itself has some guidance for next steps to address the problems. Okay, so you want to be aware of these cognitive biases, right? That's the first step to addressing them because without awareness, without knowledge, you won't get too far. But you also want to have a technique to address a number of them at once. 
And a really important one for future proofing effectively is a technique for when you are managing a project, when you are part of a team, project team as a quality professional. So either if you're managing a project or as part of a team where you're the quality professional who is part of a project team, this is a great technique to make sure that the project doesn't fail and maximize the success of the project. So there are eight steps in this process. Gather relevant stakeholders, explain the process, develop an NBA, next best alternative, brainstorm reasons for failure, decide on the most likely ones, brainstorm how to fix them, problems, and do the same for success, and finally, revise the plan. Let's go through all of them. Now, gather relevant stakeholders. That seems self-evident, but it's not necessarily self-evident because what you want to do is not gather too many people. I've seen these, in general practices, processes fail because there are too many people. Definitely don't want more than 10. Six is really good. Eight is a good number. At 10, you're getting a little bit too, a little bit a lot, but you definitely don't want more than 10 because then it becomes hard to manage the interactions between people. And you want people with the most expertise and as well as those with higher with authority. So people with the power to make and implement decisions and people with expertise on the ground. Consider using an independent facilitator who's not part of the team itself so that you can effectively, so the team members, including the leader who will usually serve as the facilitator, can be an effective member of the group and participate effectively as opposed to simply, as opposed to focusing on running and facilitating the meeting. Next. Explain the process. You want to explain the failure proofing process, the failure proofing process, which you'll learn about. So describe all the steps so that people know what they're in for. Next, develop two NBAs, next best alternatives. Next, the, the, this way, how can you do it? Or what can you do here? How can you make the decision differently? Develop an alternative approach to getting the same goal accomplished. So you have a goal, you have your project is intended to accomplish the goal. Think about what might be some alternative ways of accomplishing that goal or alternative ways of going ahead with that project. And you want to write them down anonymously. Anonymity is really important here. So each participant should write down anonymously one NBA because that will allow them to express unpopular, politically problematic opinions. The facilitator then gathers and reads everyone's NBAs and you hold a vote to select the top two and then you have a discussion about it. And then you take an anonymous vote on whether one of the NBAs is preferable to the original plan so that people can express their voices. And if you go with the original plan, you want to see if you want to incorporate some of the NBAs into that plan. Next, imagine the project that you're trying to implement completely fails, absolutely fails. You come back to it a year from now and you think, okay, definitely failed. Why did it fail? You want to brainstorm reasons for why it failed. You don't want to say, how might it fail? That's not the question you ask because that will not give you psychological freedom to brainstorm. You really, for the brainstorming part of it, which is critical for creativity and good problem solving, you want to imagine that it completely failed. Then you want to think about, okay, it failed. You want to start these phrases that you put down by saying it failed because. So write down at least three plausible reasons for failure per person. And the facilitator gathers people's statements, highlights key themes, and you want to focus on reasons that might be politically problematic, would typically not be brought up. Then you decide on the problems that are most likely, and then discuss the possible reasons for failure, ones especially politically problematic, check for potential cognitive biases, so you have the assessment using this, and assess anonymously the probability of each reason for failure, using percentages as we did and you want to pay special attention to the ones that are most harmful, most negatively impactful. Then, how do you fix those problems? This is your chance to brainstorm ways of fixing those problems, the ones that are most relevant, and address potential mental blind spots, the cognitive biases, using the assessment. So this is kind of almost an advance, because that's what you really want to do. You don't want to be like that restaurant chain that later discovers, oh, we went 90% of our budget, I mean, 90% of our construction projects go over budget. That's not what you want to do. So you want to address these problems in advance. And you want to do the same for success. How can you maximize success? That's not only the problems that you want to address, but you also want to maximize opportunities. Imagine that it succeeded spectacularly. And then what are the ways of achieving this outcome? How, why did it achieve this outcome? Again, anonymously write out some reasons for it. The and you want to check for cognitive biases as part of it and brainstorms ways of maximizing the success of scenarios. And finally, of course, you want to revise the plan. Revise the overall plan based on the strategic exercise and if needed, repeat the exercise. If needed means what I advise folks to do is that if you have major revisions, this is a good time to re again, repeat the exercise and see if you can do it without major revisions this time around. 
Okay, let's do a poll on this technique and see what folks think about whether this will be useful for them. <clears throat> so please go ahead and vote. See most people participated. Five more seconds for those who are still making their voice heard. <clears throat> okay, so 93% would like to use it. Great. This is, I'll send you more information about it for you to use. So you will send it around to your team, to your organization, and start to integrate it into your work. Okay, so the key takeaways that you wanna be thinking about as you're departing from the presentation, the normalcy bias refers to how we underestimate the likelihood and the impacts of major disruptors. Planning fallacies about how we feel our plans will go well and don't prepare sufficient resources. And failure proofing is a best practice for debiasing, debiasing in addressing these cognitive biases that helps us future proof our projects, decisions, and plans. So these are the three takeaways that you want to be thinking about as you're coming away from the presentation and the resources I mentioned that I'll send you around. A manual on failure proofing and sample chapters from my best-selling book, Never Go With Your Gut. And I have happy to give coachings for those who want some coaching on how to address these problems. I'll also send a copy of the assessment, forgot to mention that. So there's gonna be a poll on that, the resources. Let me know if you would like to get the resources. So please go ahead and vote on that. And in the meantime, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Gleb. That was really, really good. Um, as, as people are thinking of questions, and I'm sure some students have questions because uh, at least the students would, um, this remind, and, and maybe Justin, and I know Stephen has, has also joined us from ASQ Erie. This reminded me so much of your, of your mistake proofing, reminded me so much of failure mode effect analysis. And I, I, you know, the students, a number of the students have learned that, but I feel like it's just a little bit of a tweak of it and you're making it, you're, how do I want to say, you're like looking at it a little bit differently because you're thinking about those biases and how those might influence the completion of that failure mode effect analysis. Mm -hmm. it, it, it seems to me that, um, and I don't know, Justin and Steven, you can pipe up in terms of your, your workplace. You know, we do the failure mode effect analysis and everybody brings their biases to the table and it barely gets completed. You know, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't have the robustness that that this might help us with. Justin, were you going to comment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I see a lot as, as you're going through the polls, a, a lot of that is just common practice. And then seeing how many other people in here feel that as well is kind of sad in a way. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely a tool that could be used. Um, yeah. Especially, I like the uh, the trying to think forward of why it failed instead of trying to under or come up with reasons why it might fail. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. right. And the other part of that that I liked was trying to envision what success looks like mm -hmm. and how do you get to that success because that makes you think of it differently and perhaps think about other parameters that you would never have considered before. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's all about how our mind works. You want both of those modalities. Students, what kind of questions? Anybody else out there have questions? I know that you will. Don't be afraid. Oh, it's like dead silent. It's okay. People maybe you need to think about it some. Okay. Okay. All right. Then um, then what I'll do is um, we can. I, I want to thank you, first of all. So let's give him, uh, Dr. Gleb, a round of applause. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and I want to, um, I'm going to turn it over to Taylor, uh, and she's going to go ahead and close out the meeting. Um, and um, Taylor, I don't know if, if, if you want me to mention our next event. Yeah, Do you that'd want be me great. to do that? Okay, before I before I turn it over over to you. Well, first of all, Gleb, you'll, you'll send me that information, then I can disseminate it. Is that right? Oh, I'll just send it to folks, uh, the ones oh. who wanted it because there, is, there, uh, there was the poll.
Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. That that's that sounds great. Thank you so much. And I have to say, you know, I um, Dr. Gleb has sent me like white papers, and I have read them in the past. And it's like it's like talking to a fortune teller. I mean, you know, when you read the, <laughs> he was saying about like COVID and oh, this is that, and and what was going to come, and he's like right on the mark with this. So it's just amazing. So I'm um, I really really would appreciate anything that you can share with us. Uh, our next you. ASQ Fredonia event. This is for ASQ Fredonia. On April 27th, uh, we're having Mr. Andrew Bagley. He's coming from Fastenal. And this is actually a live event that we'll be doing in my um, that are here attending in my Operations 327 face-to-face. This is during your class time. It will be on April 27th. Uh, that the normal class time of 10 20 a.m to 11 10 all are invited it's a speaker point event and it's going to be looking at lean at the lean tools and common lean um the lean waste rather and then the um, lean tools to accommodate uh, mi- and mitigate those particular ways uh, so make it for 10 20 set it up to you now Thank you. Uh, please put your name and your email in the chat and we will make sure to add you to our mailing list we would love to have you Lisa, you're on mute. I got it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like too nervous on this. <laughs> so thank you very much, um, everybody. And uh, if you can't get it in the chat now before we close out the chat, because it's Dr. Gleb's Zoom, you can also email me at lisa.walters at fredonia.edu if you want to be a member. And Taylor, what is your email address? It is post 5716 at fredonia.edu. Thank you. All right. I think we can close out Dr. Gleb, okay? Okay, everyone. Thank you so much again. It was terrific. Everybody have a good evening. Take care. You too. Thanks, Dr. Gleb. You're very welcome. Excuse me, I wanted to ask you a question.